Good morning and welcome to the SharePoint conference and to the Microsoft, Microsoft keynotes. My name's Debbie Island and I'm the managing director from Share the Point. We organise this event and events in Australia and Singapore. So this one happens to be our sixth event in New Zealand and we started as a group of community leaders, including myself, um, who all do SharePoint in their daily lives. So we had lots of demand, I guess, from companies that we worked with and organisations that wanted to learn more about SharePoint and connect with other individuals. So hence, we started the SharePoint conference, which was in 2009 in Wellington. Was anyone at that event? Quite a few. Has anyone attended all six of our events? Just a few. And have we got any brand new people here today who haven't actually been to one of our events? Lots. Great. Well, I hope you get a lot out of it. Um, one of the things we have done is over the six years probably had about a hundred international speakers come out and that's one of the prime things about these events that do make them unique and make them incredibly valuable. So you get to mix and mingle with those people and probably a big shout out to all of them if you want to stand up my great team of speakers. This year's no different. <laughs> And I think out of, out of the 30 speakers we have here for the next two days, 25 of them have travelled to be here, so um, I do thank them for that. We also have an amazing amount of support from the ecosystem, the sponsors and the vendors. It's a great opportunity to go into the exhibit area where you can actually wander around and talk to them all and see all of the products and services that help with this event. Oh, sorry, with SharePoint. <laughs> Um, and then probably our primary sponsor, of course, and our, our main supporter is Microsoft, and they have been wonderful over the years, and it's actually really good to be able to include a keynote like this as part of the event. So we get to experience some of the things that Microsoft are looking at doing, hear from them on what their roadmap is, and give us some insight into how we, how we should be directing our businesses. So for today's keynote, for today's keynote, <laughs> no, one more. We're focusing on connect, reimagine, and transform. And we've actually got about five speakers for you today. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what they're speaking about and then hand it over to them. So Maria's gonna be touching on the cloud and the impacts that it has on our organizations. And also how, as businesses, we need to start readying ourselves for the new way of working. So it's all about business transformation and the things we should be looking to do. Julie is going to be looking at mobility, so uh, the right device, being able to work anywhere, anytime, and on any device. And then we're going to hear a little bit of a customer story from Becca, who's a huge multinational company that has been using SharePoint for several years. And the key messages there are in storing and retaining uh, informal and formal knowledge, so being able to use SharePoint as a knowledge management platform. And then Chris is going to demonstrate for us some of the newest technologies that bring a lot of these ideas together. So we get to see some of the new things there. And then Dean will also talk to us about the new Surface Pro 3. So on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Maria, who is the Business Productivity Group Lead for Microsoft New Zealand. Good morning, everyone. Today I want to talk to you about the, the challenges that our enterprise leaders are facing today. I want to talk about to discover opportunities in the cloud together and how the Microsoft Cloud offers unique opportunities to drive the best business outcomes for you. But before we talk about all these challenges, let's think about what is top of mind for enterprise leaders. So based on research data, there are three key top priorities. One is enhancing the customer experience, the other one is transforming to a digital business, and the other one is becoming more responsive. Actually, enhancing the customer experience is the most important priority for our leaders, for the business executives and for the IT executives. And why? Because it's considered the strategic growth of the companies. Actually, in the today's mobile connected world, it is very important to adapt to these changing needs and to these changing expectations that are dramatically changing. And 
That gives new chances to our business leaders, but it also gives new opportunities to compete differently, in different ways, and to do things differently. When we are talking about transforming to a digital business, we are not talking only about transforming traditional processes into, new digitized, into a new digitized world. We are talking about rethinking the processes. We are talking about rethinking the business, rethinking products, bringing new services to market. That's what we are talking about. For example, manufacturing companies, they are moving from an asset-centric world where they do not even know who their customers are to a very personalized world where they have direct customer relationships, where they're offering unique products, unique services to make it really personal. And big data and how they transform information into insights is a very, very important role. Actually, Gartner has done some research around that. And already 23% of the companies are monetizing on information. And more than 42% of the companies on this planet are already reimagining producing new products and new services that are customer-centric. When we're talking about becoming more responsive, actually that's a natural outcome when business are transforming to this digitized world. And as data becomes more and more important, it helps also our enterprise leaders to take fast decisions, to be agile to market, and to respond quickly to this complex changing world. And that is key, and that's what gives a competitive advantage to our enterprise leaders. In order to drive the transformation, our enterprise leaders are reliant on their workforce. So they're reliant on their people. So it's very, very important also to understand how do people spend their time? Because they need to be engaged, they need to be committed, and they need to come happy and motivated every day to work. And that's probably not new to, to all of us. People spend <laughs> almost one third of their time at work. The rest of the time they spend in researching with the family, leisure, and many other activities. But let's get a little bit deeper. How do people really spend their time? When they're at work, they're not only working, they're doing research, they're reaching out to customers, they're reaching also out to friends and families, they're sharing, they're collaborating. On the flip side, when, when they're at home, they also attend calls, they also respond to emails, they do research and, custom, and companies benefit from it. So it's more about to make most of every moment where people are. So it's not so much activities, it's about the moment. But are companies prepared for this complex changing world? Let's have a look. 75% of all of business allow people to bring their personal mobile with them to work. But only 24% have really a bring your own device policy in place. Around 49% of work requires network contribution. But 80% of employees are ineffective at collaborating. 10,000 new federal and industrial regulations are created in the last five years. And now it's a shocking data what I'm going to share with you. 93% of employees responded to the survey that they are not compliant with companies' policies. 40% growth in global data generated per year. And 62% can't use it really effectively. So the question now is, are you as individuals empowered to react quickly to the changing market, to the new needs. Do you have the tools in place for that? Have you thought about how a cloud would be looking in your, ch your world with your challenges? And not the cloud that how it will be looking in the next six months, in the next year. And how would it grow in the, the second five, ten years? Where do you want to be in ten years? How would your cloud look like? There is no business that is the same. So the only cloud that really matters to you is the cloud that is tailored to your needs. It is the cloud that offers you to be nimble, the cloud that offers you to be flexible, tailored to your needs. The Microsoft Cloud is the cloud that offers that because the Microsoft Cloud offers the unparalleled productivity. The Microsoft Cloud transforms working, mobile working force into connected teams. The Microsoft Cloud offers to transform amount of data into insights 
that helps you to take decisions, quick decisions, fast decisions, react quickly, but informed decisions. The Microsoft Cloud offers you the possibility to scale at the speed that you need and to build the cloud that you need. So that's the Microsoft Cloud. So as we continue through the conversation, let's think about how your cloud might be looking in the short term and in the long term. Let me also share the vision of our recent announced CEO. Satya Nadella, he's known Microsoft. He has been working more than 22 years for the company for taking big goals. He, he is responsible. <coughs> he's one of the key pillars for transforming Microsoft to a cloud and devices company. He is responsible as one of the key pillars of building one of the biggest cloud infrastructures on this planet, hosting services like Office 65, Asia, and many, many others. So let me read his statement and what he thinks about cloud moving forward. I believe over the next decade, computing will become even more ubiquitous and intelligence will become ambient. The co-evolution of software and new hardware form factors will intermediate and digitize. <coughs> Many of the things we do and experience in business, life and our world. This will be made possible by an ever-growing network of connected devices, incredible computing capacity from the cloud, insights from big data and intelligence from machine learning. Now let's have a look where Microsoft is investing and the impact that we're having on a worldwide level. Actually, we have been investing in the transformation to devices and services for many, many years, for many decades, actually. And a lot of people actually don't know that we're offering already more than 20 years cloud services. Today, Microsoft is offering 200 online services in more than 88 markets, serving more than 1 billion of users, 1 billion, and more than 20 million of businesses. That's the Microsoft Cloud. And what is even more important is not the numbers that I've given you. It is about the learnings that Microsoft has taken from the enterprises and the consumer. So our experience and our vision for cloud is based on a very, very solid experience where we have experience around multi-countries, a diversity of customers, a diversity of, work of workloads that no other company has. So Microsoft has the vision of the productivity and social capabilities in helping to connect people together, to work together in many different ways, from anywhere, anytime, from any device. We offer the flexibility of building the cloud as you need it, hosted, private, or hybrid cloud, to scale at the speed that, that you need. And the data, very important, it's becoming much more important. We, we convert data into insights to take decisions, to go fast to market, to be agile, but informed decisions. Nobody else can scale at that level like Microsoft can. Just to read a couple of numbers. One billion of users are using Office today. That means that out of seven, one is using Office. Office 65 is available in more than 125 markets, in more than 23 20, uh, 32 languages. Windows is now certified on more than 2,400 2, devices. So that gives you a good opportunity to choose a device that you feel familiar with. Yammer, more than 8 million users using it. Skype, more than one third of the phone traffic is driven by Skype. Windows Asia, adding every day 1,000 new customers to the already existing customer base. So that's the Microsoft Cloud. So again, as we continue the conversation, let's think about how your cloud might be looking in one year, two years, five years, 10 years. So how does a cloud look like that makes enterprises move faster? We look at it from two different perspectives. One is the benefits that IT can have and how they can enable business and the, the business benefits for the business itself. Starting with the IT, talking about costs. Cost means that we are converting capital expenses to operating expenses. 
it's very important because you're shifting budgets to your strategic IT initiatives. You can also be more predictable with your budget. At the same time, you're able to scale immediately. You don't need to worry about your IT infrastructure. It works. At the same time, it speeds up your application development, so no more uh, delays on that. You can be faster to market. And last but not least, from the IT perspective, you can redeploy your IT workforce to the strategic pro projects that you require them to get the insights and gain this competitive advantage to be quick and faster than others to market. From the business perspective, the advantages are just endless. From inventing, uh, from rethinking, rebuilding new products, new services, and offering a personalized experience to your customers. So make them your advocates by using productivity, cloud, social platform. Acquiring new customers through new channels by using social and mobility platforms. Increasing their employee productivity, they can be connected working from anywhere at any time, any device. And actually, these productivity tools can be expanded to your customers, to your partners, so that the collaboration goes beyond your own company. Entering new markets in the new digitized world. Boosting business agility. So when you develop a new product, a new service, you must be quick to market faster than others. You must have this competitive advantage. The Microsoft Cloud helps you with that. And of course, redesigning business processes. And it might also mean that you have to take decisions in, in terms of new corporate structure, new IT. All that can be done with the Microsoft Cloud. So let's keep thinking about how your cloud might be looking by bringing all this together in the short term and in the long term. So the, the Microsoft Cloud is the cloud that has the most experience on this planet. And when we talk about cloud, we, we believe that you should not be giving up anything that you have today. Actually, you should be demanding much more because that's the Microsoft Cloud. It's about being connected. So we believe that the cloud should offer you opportunities to to connect much more solutions. You should not be investing your time and budget in making things work together. Technology should be doing that for you, and Microsoft Cloud does it. You should not be investing time and budget in training your employees how to use tools, how to use new tools. It should be easy and familiar to use. So it, that means that you drive faster user adoption, you drive low implementation costs, and at the end it means Teams are more productive and better business results. Flexible. You need a cloud that you, can, that you can build tailored to your needs. Again, hybrid, private, or hosted. This, you need to scale at the speed that you need, that you need for, for your business requirements. And when it comes down to security and reliability, you should not be compromising anything. You should be demanding much more than you have today. And that's why it's so important that you rely on a company like Microsoft that has the experience across so many countries, so many customers, and so many workloads. And actually, let me share a couple of names and customers that are already on the journey of reimagining with the Microsoft Cloud. Becker, Plunkett, Lemil, Yellow Pages, San John, and you can read them all up. Actually, Becca will be talking later a little bit about their experience, how they're imagining. But there is one story that I would like to share with you, and actually that's Martin Aircraft. That's a company, for the ones that might not know, that is based out of Christchurch. And they have developed and they've manufactured Martin Jetpack. So it's basically a jetpack that can be uh, flown by a pilot or with a remote system. And after 30 years of development, they were almost there to fulfill their dream, get this to market, a unique product in the world. But they needed to do different things. They needed to engage with different customers. So they needed to talk to government. They needed to talk to new um, companies. They needed to expand their workforce because they wanted to go on a global scale. They needed to protect their intellectual property. So a lot of challenges they had to face and they had to resolve if they wanted to fulfill their dream. But instead of me telling you what all, all that they have done, let me show you a video.
I remember the days of the comic books and the ideas of the Jetpack Man. We've actually got the technology and we can fly the dream. Modern Aviation was started by Glenn Martin. I was approached to see if I would be interested in taking the prototype to a commercial environment. And who wouldn't want to do that? It's the most amazing machine. We're a relatively small company right now based in Christchurch, New Zealand. We want to expand into the world. And that means we're going to have to grow both in people and the way that we operate. When I joined Martin Aircraft Company, the first thing I noticed was the lack of IT infrastructure. I needed something that's going to support me for the future. We actually went out to three vendors as part of our process. Some recommended Google, but I was really looking for something that was usable, scalable, and affordable. Office 365 met that. Their infrastructure was quite antiquated. It was a case of putting something in place that was a bit more robust and a bit more user-friendly and obviously scalable. Key team members are frequently traveling, so they need communications that are always on and work anywhere. The ability to work with it when you're in a hotel lobby a thousand miles away, you can still get access to everything you need. You can still edit and compose and send emails exactly the same as you always have done. It's all about mobility for me. Link is probably the most important component for me right now. I need to be able to talk in real time to my staff, wherever I am in the world. SharePoint is essential for a global company. You need immediate access and share that information with your staff and with your clients and your customers. February 22nd, 2011, when the big earthquake hit Christchurch, it was really a turning point in the way that many, many companies thought about their IT infrastructure, their disaster recovery and business continuity safeguards. The earthquake was a difficult time for Christchurch. Office 365 means I don't have to worry anymore. Having the cloud capability and having backup systems that allow us to be able to operate from anywhere are essential for our environment. As a CEO, I need to be agile. The cloud is a very important aspect of being able to drive that agility to my customer. The important element of when you're taking a small company public is to have the enablers to be able to do so. Glenn Martin and his team of engineers and myself are taking this jetpack to reality. One of those enablers is in the IT system, and that IT system is Office 365. Amazing story. So what have they really done? They faced the challenges they kept the users productive, they protected the company information, and they expanded the business. So they, they were able to fulfill really their dream. At the end, it comes down that enterprise leaders need to focus on a device and service company that, that help their people to make most in every moment they are in life, at work and outside of work. And the Microsoft Cloud offers that. We have the worldwide footprint, we have data centers around the world. We have operating system network and server coverage around the world. Today we are offering, again, more than 200 online services in more than 88 countries, serving more than 1 billion of users and more than 20 million of business. That's the Microsoft Cloud. In summary, what Microsoft Cloud can, can offer you is an enterprise-grade solution that provides you the security and the reli reli reliability that you need, that meets your expectations and exceeds your expectations. It's comprehensive and connected that allows people to work together from anywhere, anytime, any device, and extend these tools to your partner network, customer's network. It's people-focused and familiar, fast, low implementation costs, and high user adoption. It's flexible and it meets your unique business needs. You can tailor it to your requirements as you need. That's the Microsoft Cloud. Could it be your cloud? So in the next two days, when you go through sessions for the ones that will be joining the sessions, let's keep thinking how you can be building a cloud for the next year, the two years, the 10 years. Where do you want to be in 10 years? Thank you. Freedom, but it's not working. It's like a million dollar phone that you just can't ring. I reach now, try to love, but I feel nothing. Yeah, my heart is numb. Introducing now to the next speaker, which is Julia Jack.
She's the head of Vodafone New Zealand's enterprise marketing team, and she's responsible for Vodafone's mobility strategy for business and is working to help local organizations make the most of con connected technology, improve business performance, and compete on a global scale. <laughs> 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 I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm now completely distracted because I just want to know where I can get one of those jetpacks. That looked awesome. Um, so thank you very much for having me today. It's my first time ever at a SharePoint um, conference. And obviously, um, I'm not going to be talking about SharePoint, and I'm not going to be talking about Microsoft. So please be kind. Um, I'm really um, glad that you've let me into your um, community today. What I do want to talk about is um, the concept of what we call the ready business. So a business that's ready for some of that stuff that we see coming in the future, but is also ready for today. And how we see mobility enabling um, the ready business. But because I am the marketing person, the coloring in department, um, of course, what I want to do is start with a video. <laughs> I hope. Yes, no, maybe. Maybe I'm not going the right way. Uh, technology. If I move this one, will that help? No. Definitely the colouring in department. When you get dairy cows talking to dairy farmers about their productivity, that's mobility. When you have farmers in the field using applications in the cloud, that's mobility. When a building can alert its owner to the presence of drugs. When airbags call ambulances. When machines talk to machines and to people who talk to people. And work becomes what you do, not where you go. When you get everything and everyone communicating with each other, anytime, that's mobility. Helping you do business better. So what I really like about that um, video is, much as some of it looks a little bit futuristic, it's actually not a future story. All of that is capability that's being delivered today. Every sort of solution, every proposition that you saw in that video is happening out there in the real world today. So we really believe that the possibilities have never been greater and that mobility is the key to unlocking those possibilities for New Zealand and worldwide businesses, um, and that it's the key to getting businesses ready for what the future holds. So the first thing I wanted to talk a little bit about then was, um, what is it that businesses need to be ready for? So Maria talked about some of this on the way um, through her presentation. We know that the world that we live and, of course, work in is changing exponentially. We all know about the Internet of Things, the Internet of Everything, the connectedness of things. 50 billion, 60 billion devices connected by, uh, machines connected by 2020. Um, now I'm not that good at maths, but I think that works out to be something like seven, eight device, uh, things for every person on the planet. Um, we know about the rise of the new technology of smack, social, mobile, analytics, cloud. So the drive for everything as a service, the drive for multi-channel experiences for customers, for those personal experiences, for connecting with each other and with our customers through those um, social channels. But there's just a couple of things that I wanted to um, touch on, particularly in relation to New Zealand that are on this slide. First is this concept of the borderless business. So, of course, the stereotype borderless business is, I'm sorry to mention their name, Google. If you ask someone where Google is, they're not going to tell you they're in a shop or they're in a specific location or they're in a geography. Google is here. It's a completely borderless business. And for a country like New Zealand that's traditionally suffered from the tyranny of distance, the concept of a borderless business is a huge opportunity for us. On the slightly more negative side, I also wanted to touch on this one, unpredictable um, change. So you've probably heard of the concept of VUCA. Um, if you haven't, I understand it's originally a military acronym. Um, I always get the V wrong, but I'm going to get it right today. And it stands for volatility. Um, now I've forgotten what the U is, because I remembered what the V is. <laughs> uh, volatility, uncertainty, 
complexity, and ambiguity. And the things, obviously, that drive VUCA on a global scale would be things like natural disasters, so like the Japanese tsunami, political upheaval, like the Arab Spring, economic crisis, like the global um, banking crisis. But we just saw, um, in the last presentation, a very, very local example of VUCA at work in New Zealand um, with the earthquake in Christchurch. So while businesses can't be expected to predict the future, increasingly, as we saw in that video, they have to be ready to make themselves more resilient to respond to those kind of unpredictable changes, to be able to operate through them, or at least to be able to get up and running um, very quickly afterwards. So we know that there's all these global macro trends and pressures coming down on businesses. Um, but we also know that each business has its individual ambitions, its objective, its challenges. So what makes us so convinced that mobility is the answer to addressing these challenges and to harnessing the opportunities? Well, I want to start, I guess, where we should probably always start, which is with the customer. Um, Maria already talked about the fact that customer experience and getting the right customer experience is kind of the thing that's at the top of mind of our business leaders, of our CEOs. So what do our customers want these days? Well, probably to summarize it, up, summarize it up is whatever you are offering to customers, they want more of it and they want it better and they want it faster. So 70% of customers expect a response in less than two hours. We are now in the digitized, always on, always connected, always got this with me world. I think two hours is probably actually getting long for some customers. 78% of business goes to the company who answers first or who responds first. So you need to put your, co your company in the position where they can always respond to the customer however the customer wants to contact you. And, as you see from the bottom one, of course the way customers want to contact us is changing. The way customers want to connect with businesses, the way customers even want to experience customer care and customer service. At Vodafone, we now have a big customer care team who only interact with our customers via social media. So the way that customers talk to you, they want to do it in the channels that they're used to using in their everyday lives, the channels that they want to come to you through, not the channels that you necessarily might want them to come through. And of course, it's not just um, customers' expectations that are getting greater. And again, um, Maria talked about this as well. Employees' expectations are getting ever greater. Um, I was reading an article recently about the fact that there are now four generations of employees in the workplace. I think it's officially traditionalists, baby boomers, um, Gen X, and Gen Y. All of those generations have slightly different expectations, may maybe, of what they want from work. But I think we have to move away from the cliche of thinking that it's just those Gen Yers coming into the workplace who are driving this demand for flexible working. I, unfortunately, am not Gen Y. Um, and I probably came into the workplace when it was a more traditional nine to five environment. But I now expect, especially working for a company like Vodafone, I expect to have those flexible, flexible options around the way I work. So 86% of employers are seeing that demand for flexible working. 72% of employees say it improves their job satisfaction. And that's really key because if 63% of CEOs are actually concerned about being able to find the people with the right skills to fill the jobs, and employees want to work flexibly, then you need to be able to offer those options if you want to attract and retain the best talent. So you need to be offering the options of different times to work, different places to work, and of course, different ways of working. And being able to bring that all important smart device that's so central to your everyday life, being able to bring that into work and use it as your work device as well, which is quite, it's quite scary that only, um, I think it was 24% of businesses actually have that bring your own device um, policy in place. So, Making your people more flexible can, of course, help you to respond more quickly to your customers, but it can also create that more loyal, motivated, and engaged workforce. So that's all very well. We all want to do more for our customers, and we all want to do more for our people. But if you were to ask any business, large or small, in New Zealand, what's you know, your number one objective, challenge, priority, I think probably something around improving efficiency, improving productivity would come out. So can you do all this for your people um, and your customers and be more efficient? And really, obviously, by being more efficient, we mean taking out some of those costs. Businesses really want to get rid of those sunk costs around things like property um, and infrastructure. 
They want to um, get rid of those complex, time-consuming, resource-intensive back-end um, processes. So 60% of global businesses already in the cloud using some form of cloud computing. I've seen that stat everywhere from 60% up to 80%. But the one thing everybody agrees on is it's just increasing all the time. And lots of businesses seeing the benefit of mobile working, not just in terms of being more responsive to customers and creating that more engaged workforce, but also a direct cost reduction, 40% reduction in property and travel costs. And that last stat, 22% of monthly deadlines are still missed just because the right person can't be found at the right time. So improving efficiency, improving productivity always means being more responsive, being there, being able to um, deal with the issue, deal with the customer, meet the deadline um, in the right time frame. So to summarize all of that, when we then think of a ready business, so a business that's ready to capitalize on the opportunities that the changing environment is creating and to address the challenges, we think of a business that's operating efficiently, so it's responsible, it's scalable, it's in an environment of continuous improvement, that works flexibly, collaborative, very important in terms of what you guys are going to be talking about in the next two days, collaborative, a more productive workforce and a more engaged and loyal workforce, and doing all that in an environment where you are keeping everything safe and secure. And this one is really obviously very important. The more we talk about those smarter ways of working, flexible working, everything in the cloud, everybody connected, anytime on any device, security starts to bubble to the surface is quite a big issue. 61% of CIOs are now saying that security is their number one priority. They have to find ways to mitigate the risks, not just for themselves, to ensure that their own company systems and data and people are safe and secure, but also so they can give their customers the reassurance and the guarantee that the customer data is safe and secure. Um, and working in the communications business, where we hold a lot of very sensitive information on what you all do out there with your phones, we understand better than anybody the importance of making sure that all that data, all that information is kept very, very secure. So there are a lot of challenges. Working flexibly, working smarter for some organizations is a huge challenge, and that's probably why only 24% of them have that BYOD policy in place, because it does mean completely different ways of managing your people, completely different ways of connecting and collaborating new HR policies and practices, new IT policies and practices. But for businesses that can get it right, it's also a massive opportunity. Because those businesses who can operate more efficiently, who can work more flexibly, who can do all that in a safe and secure environment, they're then the businesses who can go on to be more competitive, who can create those new revenue streams and those new business models, who can be delivering those new experiences and those personal interactions for their customers who can actually be the leaders, the innovators, and from a New Zealand perspective, the ones that are taking that Kiwi innovation out to the world. So we believe mobility can help businesses do all that. It can get them ready for those challenges and those opportunities. But there is a bit of a pathway involved. Not every business is going to transform itself and fully mobilize itself um, tomorrow. So we do talk to businesses about the kind of journey or the pathway towards mobility. You might just be starting down this end, where it's just about simplification, getting rid of some of that complexity, getting rid of some of that cost, not necessarily having to have everybody on a desk phone and a mobile phone. Right up to the end, where you're actually fully mobilizing your processes, your systems, and your business models, and finding completely new and innovative ways to run your business and take your services out to your customers. So it is a pathway, um, and we challenge businesses when they're thinking about their mobility strategy to ask themselves some really simple questions. So the first question, obviously, is are you ready for the changes that the environment is creating? Are you ready for the greater demands of your customers and your workforce? Are you ready for VUCA and the potential of those unpredictable changes? What transformations are you seeing in your industry? What is social, mobile, analytics and cloud driving within your industry? And are you keeping ahead of that curve, or are you meeting it, or are you lagging behind? Are you asking your employees how they would improve your business? 
Everybody is out there doing amazing things with amazing applications in their personal lives. So are you um, crowdsourcing? Are you asking your people what they're doing in their personal lives that could have an application and could come in and could help improve your business? And finally, and most importantly, what actually is your key business challenge or your transformation objective? What is it that you want to achieve? And it's not really about what do you want to achieve with mobility, it's what do you want to achieve, and then let's see how mobility can help you do that. And a case in point that I want to share with you is um, one of our favorite case studies, which is the New Zealand police. So the New Zealand police came to us with probably the most, uh, or one of the biggest business challenges um, I've ever seen. How can we reduce the crime rate in New Zealand by 15%? So you wouldn't immediately think your mobility strategy is going to help you um, reduce the crime rate in New Zealand by 15%. Um, but here's the way it works. We have um, around 6,500 of the frontline police staff enabled with smart devices, so either tablets or phones or a combination of both. We have a bespoke app development center that's developing the apps that they use on those devices. And what that's done is reduced um, per officer per shift, reduced, increased their productivity by 30 minutes, so reduced the amount of time they need to spend on paperwork and going back to the station and processing things by 30 minutes. That's the equivalent of 520,000 hours a year, which is the equivalent of an extra 345 police officers on the front line in New Zealand, which is what the New Zealand police believe it will take to get them closer to that target of reducing the crime rate by 15%. So when they thought about their mobility strategy, yes, they thought about operating more efficiently and taking costs out and simplifying. Yes, they thought about allowing their officers to be more flexible and not be tied to coming back to the station all the time. But ultimately, what they had in mind was that big transformation objective. So meeting the challenges, meeting the opportunities, but then going further and really unlocking something that previously would have seemed impossible. And when we get into the place with mobility where it's driving those new business models, those new ways of working, completely changing processes, um, that's when it starts to get really exciting. So I wanted to share another few examples of how that's working. And a lot of that, of course, is then related back to this internet of things, everything connected. So an internet connected cow? Well, kind of. Um, there's a company um, in Ireland called Keenan's, and they are the manufacturer of specialist feeding equipment for dairy farmers. They are now in 50 countries deploying those machines. Those machines are enabled with technology that means back in Ireland, they can get real-time data out of every machine, allowing them to aggregate the data, allowing them to optimize the feed, the mixes, the um, quantities that are going out through those machines. And for their dairy farmers, they've increased the milk production per cow per day by 1.75 kilograms. So completely new business models around farming. A completely new business model around um, shopping. That's what this little grocery thing is here. Um, pocket shop in America. Looking at online shopping, now you would think online shopping, it's probably, you know, it is what it is. Not much more you can do with that. Using location-based services, they've actually been able to guarantee that they can get your groceries to you within the hour. So they have a fleet of kind of casual labor going around the place. The jobs get deployed to them via the smart devices, location-based um, GPS tells them that they're in the right place and they can get your groceries to you within the hour. Reinventing insurance. This one's a bit scary if you haven't heard about it before. Usage-based insurance. So why should we all get penalized if we are less risky drivers because of the riskier drivers? So why is there an assumption that everybody who's young drives more um, recklessly than older people. All of these things that our insurance premiums are based on. Usage-based insurance, the mobile technology in the car, records the profile of what you actually do when you drive. So where do you park? Is it a safe place or a not safe place? How fast do you drive? How many emergency stops do you do? Are you swerving a lot? And it will create a bespoke profile for you that you can then use with the insurers to get the right premium based on the way you drive. Similarly, in the driving space, you saw up front the airbag that talks to the ambulances. That's true. It's been deployed in Europe. Um, the air, as soon as the airbag's deployed, 
mobile technology contacts the emergency services. And they reckon in um, Europe that will cut the response time by about 40% in urban areas and by about 50% in rural areas. And then before I um, give you some local examples, I did want to talk about two more international ones. I hope I've got time. The vending machine. Um, in India, a leading software drinks company came to us with a very unique problem. They've got 350,000 vending machines in India, and every year 10% of them simply disappear. <laughs> it gets weirder. People steal them to use as fridges in their houses. <laughs> However, with a mobile SIM in the vending machine, that company can now track exactly where its vending machines have gone to and come and knock on your door and request very politely if they can have their machine back, please. And of course, that technology is also recording all that other data for them about um, you know, stock taking, basically, how many chips are left, do we need to restock the Coke, all that kind of stuff. And then the pills here is the last international one I want to mention, because this really is testing the limit of what's possible. There's a company um, in America called Proteus BioCare, I think, or Biomedicine. They've developed digestible silicon. The digestible silicon is encoded. It goes into a pill. It's got a unique code, unique to that pill and unique to the person taking the pill. When you take the pill and it dissolves, the stomach acids act like a battery. You remember um, chemistry, school chemistry. Um, it sends a signal from the silicon to a patch that you wear on your abdomen. That then sends a message to your healthcare provider, your doctor on their smart device, tells them when you took the pills um, and how much of the pills you took. So it sounds a little bit frightening, but if you think about um, developing countries, areas of high illiteracy, the elderly, um, people with mental disabilities, that's completely changing their lives, allowing them to be much more um, independent. And then I just wanted to finally mention two Kiwi ones, because this really is the area where I feel like mobility is helping Kiwis take innovation to the world. The first one you saw actually in the video as well, a Kiwi company called Methminder developed a technology that it looks a bit like a smoke alarm. You put it in, in your house if you're a landlord and you're renting out your property, and again, remotely, it will tell you if your property is being used to uh, manufacture pee. <laughs> Which is a big problem for landlords. <laughs> If anyone doesn't know, if anyone's not from New Zealand doesn't know what P is, um, one of your Kiwi colleagues will tell you. Um, and then the final one, which is also a farming one, is Precision Tracking. This is a company a little bit like Keenan's with the, food, the feed distribution, but this is fertilizer distribution management. Very sexy. Machines that are going out distributing fertilizer. But actually, again, through mobile technology, for being able to combine all that data, bring it back, analyze it in New Zealand without ever having to leave the country, um, they are able to optimize that distribution for farmers, save them thousands of dollars, and help their environmental impact by controlling the amount of nitrogen runoff that they have into the waterways. So two completely new business models that those Kiwi companies have adopted and allowing them to take innovation out to the world. And there's um, hundreds of examples. I could talk about this area um, for hours. But that really is where we see the kind of the real possibility of mobility. It's not about networks, it's not about devices, it's not about fiber, it's not about cloud, it's about all of those things working together, completely connecting people, things, machines, enabling completely new business models, complete transformation. And the last example I want to give you is one that's um, very close to home. So about seven years ago, Vodafone um, opened their new headquarters um, in the viaduct. And at that time, it was really cutting edge. It was a very mobilized building. We don't have any desk phones. Most of us don't actually have a desk. We um, are completely open plan, and we hot desk all the time, and there's nothing wired in. We don't have um, computers or terminals or um, desk-based phones. And we operate that building at about 120% occupancy because of the flexible working options. However, now we're going to take it to the next level. We recently announced um, the new building that we're opening in Christchurch in 2016, and that is going to be, for us, the case study for the ready business in New Zealand, a fully mobilized business, paperless, wireless. That one probably run about 130% occupancy. So I just, again, want to show you a little video, if it works, of what we're planning to do down in Christchurch.
celebrating a new beginning for Vodafone and Christchurch. Introducing the most technologically advanced building in New Zealand. Visitors will be welcomed and directed to their meetings via their smartphone. And staff will use their smartphone as the ultimate security pass. Smartphones and tablets will be at the heart of the work experience. It's completely wireless with no cables and power by proxy. With open plan, flexible and collaborative workspaces, there's no printing, no paper waste. Video is the new voice in a fibre world. All screens will be networked as real-time digital displays. Vodafone's new Christchurch office, showcasing the very best of our pioneering technology, delivering new levels of productivity and convenience for our employees, customers and partners. Connecting the most advanced working environment right here in the heart of Christchurch. Um, so for us, we think this is going to be the ultimate example of really eating your own dog food, as the saying goes. So finally, just, just to wrap up for me, when we talk about the ready business, fully enabled by mobility, what we're talking about is a business that is totally connected. Everything to everybody. You'll hear um, Vaughan and Chris talk a little bit more about that idea of a, bus of a network business and what that means and how it works and specific examples of how that's working. But for us, really, when we think about networks now and the business as a network, we're actually even thinking about it as, as maybe as a nervous system. So everything connected to everything else, everything sending those signals to everything else, and a network that then actually, without wishing to sound too um, terminator about it, actually learns and evolves and changes and develops and continues to keep that business ready for now um, and for the future. So that's all from me. Um, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Vaughan Robertson, who is, I'll try and get this right, um, the Group Manager for Technology Services at Becca, and he has a really, really awesome story to tell you about what they're doing, and you'll be pleased to hear that this is all about um, SharePoint as well. <laughs> I'll take it in, but don't look down. I'm on top of the world, hey. I'm on top of the world, hey. Technology works. Look at that. Thank you very much. Um, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Becca, but first of all, just let's talk about you. How many people here are IT people? How many people are not IT people? Okay, geeks. Right. Okay. Well, well, we'll work on that as we go. This is really not an IT story. It's a it's an application story or an an applied story. So we'll we'll get to it anyway. Quick bit of background about Becker to put it in perspective. Uh, we're a small business um, by international standards. We're big in New Zealand, but small elsewhere, about 3,000 staff. I guess the key thing is with our business is that we're very broad. I think if we were um, uh, an engineering firm of this size in the States or somewhere else, we'd probably all be fire engineers. But we're not. We cover about 70 different disciplines and uh, cover just about every engineering discipline that there is. I think we're quite good at collaboration. I think uh, what we find is that when we work in one area, uh, we're as good as anybody else. When we work across, um, collaborating across our sections, we tend to do better than most. It's quite helpful, I guess. Um, what else? We've got an Asia-Pacific footprint. Debbie kindly called us multinational, and that's true to an extent. We work in about 70 different countries. But our, our primary focus is Asia-Pac, and we go as far north, this is in terms of offices, uh, as far north as Beijing, and as far south as Dunedin. And for your information, there's about 11,000 kilometers between those, which is sort of pretty big. Here's a quick snapshot on a few of our projects. This is the Melbourne desal plant, $4.7 billion project. Uh, here's one you might recognize. Does anybody know Waterview? Heard of Alice, the tunnel boring machine? Water view, yeah, okay, well that's that one. We also designed the Sky Tower, um, had a lot to do with the Vic Park Tunnel, and interestingly, or as a variation, we were also involved with producing the avionics software for the upgrade for the P3 Orion. So it's a pretty diverse sort of a portfolio of work. 
Um, Marina Bay Sands, has anybody been there? Pretty cool spot, isn't it? We project manage this, I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, just a warning, it's fantastic. Get up the top if you're ever in Singapore, go and have a look at the infinity pool. Just watch the Chardonnay though, it's um, 30 bucks a glass, <laughs> something. Got a bit caught there, <laughs> dangerous. All right, let's get on to it really. Uh, SharePoint usage in, in Becca. Now, I think we've been using um, SharePoint since before it was trendy. Um, back in 2004, and I have to have a quick shout out here to our enterprise architect, Richard Adlard. Is he in the room? Somewhere here, he was going to be here. Oh, there he is, yeah. He's probably led us on this over getting on 10 years. He's been the one that said, oh, yeah, yes, we can, when a whole lot of people said, oh, how do we do this? So uh, he's been doing it since way back then. Um, we started with SharePoint 2003. We've gone through a couple of upgrades since then. We are on the journey, or just beginning the journey to the upgrade to 2013. So I think what that says is that we're not ahead of the pack. This is not a story about somebody who's right out there and invested ahead of the curve and so on. We're just, we're just in the group. Um, how many people are on 2013, SharePoint 2013? Right, so, you know, we're way ahead of us. Um, where are we now? Hang on. Oh, a couple of, sorry, a couple of quick uh, notes on this, and this is a, a quick lessons learned. We've used it primarily out of the box. There's a couple of traps, really. We've used it primarily out of the box. We've generally configured it rather than customised it. I'd have to say pretty much every time we've got into anything major in the customization area, we've got ourselves in trouble. And the key with that is, of course, when you customise and then you go to upgrade, you often, not always, but often have to recustomize. So you've got to put that in your business case or put that in your thinking when you're starting. You can do anything with it, but my experience is if you keep it as much close to vanilla as you can, it's helpful. Um, I would say with that, that the, as you go through the versions, you'll find that the um, application becomes more and more flexible, so you can do more with configuration rather than customization. And the other trap, and I, I'll say this, but actually just back on customization, I know my colleagues were horrified when I started messing with sites using um, SharePoint Designer. Uh, as an IT manager, I was a superb end user example uh, for every minute I spent customizing SharePoint using SharePoint Designer, my dev team would spend an hour correcting it. Uh, I think they actually took it off my desktop in the end. <laughs> Nasty people. Very mean. I would say um, the other piece of trouble that we got into was, was when we got into too much in the way of complex access rights. We'd have uh, sites, and I'll talk about how we used it shortly, but when we have sites and we try and get too clever with, oh, this person can have access rights to that piece and that piece and that piece and that piece, and role-based and change the defaults on the, on the access side of things, tended to get us into, or it's tended to get us into more trouble than the benefits we've got out of it. So those two tricks, keep it out of the box unless you've got good reason to, and keep it simple in terms of the access would be lessons. Okay, what are we doing right now? And of course, this is getting onto the story of today. We're still doing the project collaboration extranets. I might point out that at, um, at some point over that period, we were reputed to be the second largest user of SharePoint by document numbers held after telecom. Um, so, and we had, had roughly, I think, 400 um, collaboration extranets. Becker's generally runs about 2,000 projects at once, so having 400 collaboration extranets is not out of the ordinary for us. And we're still doing it, and they're still working for us, and they're still used across our whole business. Uh, more recently, for the last two, three years, we've been developing, ongoing, a project delivery system which is basically the way Becca does stuff. And that's been based on SharePoint, and that has been very successful for us. And I guess I'll round out why a little bit later. It's to do with consistency. Um, but PDS has been great for us, and it's an ongoing uh, development. We've got ways to go yet with it. Um, thirdly, and we've had a couple of other things, but thirdly, and the th one I want to focus on today is our knowledge centers. Um, and I use TDG as an acronym for you people. This is an engineering acronym to you geeks. It stands for Technical Discipline Group. Didn't know that, did you? There's an acronym you didn't know. Okay. 
Good stuff. Um, where was I going with this? Yeah, the, the key thing with knowledge centres is, is, and how we've used them is probably valuable here because you guys could all benefit from pretty much the same thing. I think a lot of us are in the knowledge industry. Um, so TDGs, a technical discipline group. Our, our business is diverse. It's got about 70 different disciplines. And it, you know it's just amazing. And trying to get your head around it's pretty hard. Water, fire, structural, wastewater, airports, runways, uh, roading, civil engineering, um, software engineering, systems engineering. We've got the whole shooting box. These have been grouped into roughly into 12 TDGs, technical discipline groups. And each one of these has hopefully a relatively uh, common interests. They're not that common actually. We get one TDGs, they call it GAS, it's Geotechnical Airpoint, Airports and Structural, I think. Can't remember. So, so they're a, a fairly general sort of a grouping. Um, most importantly, though, they do provide the opportunity for people to, um, to, to group their knowledge as they go. So, just a quick, uh, I know this is hopefully self evident. Why is knowledge critical? Well, it's our core business. It's what we sell. We don't have assets. Our assets are our people. Um, we need to be seen as trusted advisors to our customers. That's what we sell. Our key assets, our people. And of course, the value of that asset is correlated specifically with the training and the experience and the insights of those individuals within the organisation. And I, I suspect a lot of the people in the audience here will have the same issue. It, you know, your, your assets, your people. Um, intellectual property, the application of knowledge these days um, is difficult. You've got to keep it fresh, you've got to keep it relevant. Um, the example in the, in the Google world, the doctor, is the doctor's call, you know, when you go and see the doctor, it's a second opinion. You've already got your first opinion from Google or from Bing or from MedDB, haven't you? So, so you know, so, so when you're talking about experts in knowledge, they had better have insights. They better be better than a Google search. A um, couple of other things that I think are obvious. Risk mitigation. If you've got knowledge and it's stored and it's constant, then you, you lower your risks by reusing the same information and the same knowledge. And likewise, it's much more efficient to use things over and over than it is to reinvent the wheel. Now, how many engineers here? And I, I don't mean software engineers, I mean engineers, engineers. None? Good. One, two. Okay. Engineering people are funny people. Yeah. Like, why would I use that old wheel? You know, uh, my raison d'etre is to build wheels, to design wheels. Why would I use your damn wheel? I'd build my own wheel, thank you very much. And the other thing is you think of them, and as I say, I better be careful here, I get in trouble, but um, you think of them as being technologically ahead, but I've got a perfectly good slide rule that I've been using for 40 years. Why the hell would I change that? So there are, some, there are some peccadilloes with the personalities that you work with that you actually impact on these things. The key thing is trying to get efficiency and trying to get people to reuse stuff actually can be quite difficult when they consider that their own raison d'etre is not about that. So all right, let's get on to knowledge and, and the application of it and SharePoint. How do we manage our knowledge? The key point is we use, sorry, the, the key thing is we use SharePoint to hold the structured data defined and agreed knowledge artefacts. Now these things have come from uh, validated, authorised um, experts. And you'd note, and I think I showed in the previous slide, our experts go from, in a TDG, they'll go from a member of a TDG through to a fellow, through to a chief engineer who by definition is an industry luminary, uh, wider than New Zealand very often. Um, so they have the authority to be able to say, yep, that is the way we do stuff. Now there will be discussion around these things, but once they're authorised, once they're validated, they go into the relevant knowledge centre and they're held there and then they can be reused and so on. That becomes the gospel according to Becker uh, in that particular area. And of course, you know, it's very broad. It can be uh, very similar across 2D TDGs, but actually different knowledge. To use um, an engineering analogy here, that becomes a foundation. And it's a very useful foundation. It's strong, it's solid, it's lasting. The difficulty is that it can be a bit grey and a bit dull and a bit unchanging and a bit boring and sometimes it's left hidden and sometimes it's 
just completely forgotten, as foundations quite often are. Now that can be dangerous over time, of course. So all right, how do we improve the knowledge? How do we extend it? I find it interesting today that SharePoint hasn't been mentioned much, and, and one of the thrusts of my conversation here is going to be it's the integration of these things. It's the sharing of these things. It's the how you put them together that matters. So we're a great Yammer user. We've been using it for only a year, a year osh, just a little bit over a year. But we use it very uh, um, efficiently in terms of the knowledge area. How do we do it? Well, we've got Yammer feeds that are attached to the knowledge center. Now, I would hasten to add that Yammer conversations are not knowledge. They're absolutely acknowledged as not being knowledge. However, they do contribute to it. So we have up to, depending on the TDG, we have up to three different Yammer feeds attached to the Knowledge Centre. The first is a, um, a broadcast facility for the TDG to take its standards and its agreed knowledge and broadcast that to its constituency. So that's an outbound thing done by the experts on the TDG. The second one is um, TDG relevant Yammer conversations. So what might happen here is somewhere in the Yammer conversations across the company, somebody comes up with a point around water. So what they'll do is either at the time or retrospectively, they'll come in and they will pop a tag, hashtag water TDG on us. Everybody comfortable with topic tags or hashtags, how that all works? So you attach the topic tag to the conversation. And the Yammer feed automatically gathers up anything with that topic tag, sorts it to latest, and puts it in a Yammer feed that's attached to the Knowledge Center. So that means that you've got a current feed of conversations relating to that particular TDG. And then thirdly, the, again the TDG experts can tag various parts of various conversations as being, hey, this is really relevant, this is really useful. So it's a moderated display of conversations. Now, I just repeat, this is not knowledge. It's a contribution to the development of knowledge, but not knowledge itself. The, the Yammer conversations are quite fluffy, can, can be quite amorphous, you know, like a dinner party conversation. Um, engineers, engineers, by definition, are very opinionated. True, guys? Yeah? Okay. Um, they're also very knowledgeable in the area, obviously. Um, and so what happens is you get good, robust debate. Sometimes the debate's a bit silly. I've never seen it unprofessional, but sometimes that's sort of a bit boring. Uh, other, <laughs> sorry. other times it can be enlightening and, and quite gobsmacking um, when you get people talking about the way to use cloud or cluster computing for computational fluid dynamics. I had to say that 10 times in front of a mirror, by the way, to get it right. CFD, another acronym engineering acronym. Um, some of the conversations can be really, really in, uh, insightful and, and exciting. So, so to take that fluffy cloud stuff and put it right together with the foundations of the business, what it does is it refreshes that knowledge. It means that those luminaries are, can take that insight and plug it into the established body of knowledge and therefore it remains refreshed and it remains uh, relevant and it remains current. So, in summary, and, and these are hobby horses, and I, I unashamedly jump on them, but uh, first of all, integrate the tools. SharePoint's marvelous. SharePoint's great. Uh, it's even better when you use it with stuff. We use SharePoint with Yammer, obviously. We, we're a great Link user. Uh, we've, we're a relatively early adopter of Link, and it's transformed our business. The, the communication that you get from Link's fantastic. But what we'll do is we'll share conversations. We will record presentations from Link, and we'll store them in SharePoint so that this, people can self-serve them afterwards. So it's a combination of the two that's fantastic. Um, we use SharePoint with our legacy document system. Uh, it's got its own UI, but it's easy for us to be consistent to actually expose our legacy document system artifacts through using SharePoint. Um, so that's integration. First thing we've talked about, what's it, that acronym? SMAC. I haven't heard that particular one, but that's really good. I like it. Social, mobile, analytics, or, or big data and cloud. They're the uber trends, right? Everybody knows them. They've been around for quite some time now. One thing I'd say that my experience has been 
look at the intersections. There's a rich vein of innovation and opportunity and uh, good value out of the intersections where, where mobile meets cloud or where cloud meets social or where, the, where these things actually interact. That's really useful. So look for, look for value at the intersections. Thirdly, application. It's about the application. These tool sets are cool. They're really good and you can spend a whole lot of time messing with them. But it's the application of them to your own purposes that actually makes the difference to them. It's, you know, you can do the same out of the box as somebody else and all you get is a business that's the same as somebody else. It's when you apply them to your own purposes that you're on a winner. Now, two traps with that. First of all, I mentioned the customization thing. So I say apply them, but configure them if you can and avoid customization. I know there's a whole lot of people that do that for a living, so that's fair enough. But try not to try not to get too far out of the box unless you can justify it carefully. Secondly, there's this trap. I'll go to the marketing people and I'll say, okay, we're looking at a new CRM. What do you want? <laughs> what do they say? What have you got? Go out to the market and tell us what they do, right? So you go out to the CRM vendors, in my role, and you say, tell us the latest things with CRM and the cloud and all of this stuff. And they say, well, what do you want? <laughs> Vicious cycle. The application is important. It's not about the technology, it's about how you apply it. And finally, and most importantly, most importantly, remain agile. I've been bitten the most in my life by doing the big project. That's the worst thing I've ever done. The biggest project is the worst because by the time you get to the end of the project, it's out of date. And um, I think we've all probably been there. So I'm taking a principle now of doing exactly the minimum that I can get away with to have an, have an impact, to have an effect, and then look at it again, and then change it again, and be aware that it's going to change. Most importantly, change is truly the only constant these days. We know that. So work toward being comfortable with being constantly in transition. And if you can do that and manage the... I'll come to that. If you can do that, it's um, valuable. What's next for us? I'm not going to stand up here next year and say we've done this, okay? Because this is a big portfolio. But, the, but these are the things that we're looking at. These are the things that Richard's going to deliver next year, right? Beauty. Um, first of all, a little bit of acronym soup. Is everybody comfortable with these? I'll go through them briefly and roughly and without the sophistication that they need. Mobile MDMs, the platform management. Find my iPhone, you know. It's probably a done deal. We're probably pretty good with all of that now. Obviously, in the business context, if you leave your tablet at the pub, you're in trouble, right? Um, EMM and DLP. EMM is the application. DLP is getting down to the file level, and that's the thing for the future. I won't talk about cloud. I think people have covered it, but I love personal cloud. I love my OneDrive, um, OneNote combination. It's fantastic. Social, uh, big data analytics we've covered, social and social listening and how it works on the business is really important. Our business, again, engineers don't do, don't do um, Facebook, sorry. We're getting better, they're getting LinkedIn profiles, they're getting, we're even learning how to use Twitter a little bit, so we're making progress on it. Finally, you know, this is very dry, so I had to get some humour in here. Who has not heard of XKCD? Look at that. Everybody knows it, okay? Expectation management, you see, it's most important for all of us. And I highly recommend, if you've got five minutes, go and randomly choose some XKD CD cartoons because you won't get about 80% of them, but the ones that you do get will be really funny, all right? Thank you very much. <laughs> and now I'll just introduce CJ, Chris Johnson's from Microsoft. He's an avid developer, speaker, and author, and in the uh, group product manager in the Office 365 team at Microsoft in, in Redmond. He leads a team focused on making Office 365, SharePoint, and Office, and making them a great place for ISVs and developers to build solutions and applications. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Cheers. Cheers mate. All right, good morning, everybody. It's not that early, come on, good morning. Good morning. All right, uh, thank you for the nice introduction. My name is Chris Johnson and I'm jet lagged. 
Uh, I know that for two reasons. One, I got up at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And the second one is I tried to uh, shave with, uh, with hair gel this morning. And it um, didn't go so well. So, uh, so excuse me if I'm, if I'm a little lagged. Today, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Um, first up, uh, as a product, we are announced uh, recently at the SharePoint conference earlier this year. Uh, it's been recently renamed Delve. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with the code name, it used to be Oslo. Uh, it was called Oslo for a really tricky and subtle reason, uh, that it was built in Oslo. <laughs> uh, but the branding folks have come up with something even better, which is now called Delve. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about today. But if you cast your minds back for a moment, a few years, uh, when... We had document storage and so forth, uh, mainly around files and folders and things. People used to have to browse for information. You had to kind of know where to go look, maybe which file share it was on, for example, maybe which folder it was in, maybe you built your whole career around knowing where to navigate in your organization to find bits of information. And then we sort of took a little step forward and we said, oh, we can do a little bit better than this. And so the 10 blue links came along, right? You go and search on your favorite search engine, bing, and, uh, and you, get your, you get your list of results, or maybe SharePoint search or something along those lines, uh, and you, then you got to pick from your results. But it's very sort of stacked, ranked, and so forth, and that's why, kind of what we're used to today, and that really changed the game from that notion of browse to that notion of search. We think we can do even better than that. We think at Microsoft that we can help people discover information rather than necessarily having to browse for it, and rather than people necessarily having to go and search for it, we think we can use the tacit knowledge in an organization to help folks discover interesting things going on around them with their group of peers, with other folks working on the other side of Becca, for example, uh, or in other parts of the world. And we do that with this application we call Delve. It's powered on a new information fabric we call the Office Graph, which is a way of taking all of the information and interactions and actions in an organization and using that to help drive a discovery uh, of information. Delve is a first experience powered by Office Graph. Uh, third parties will be able to go and use our APIs that we're going to release to go and build additional uh, sort of experiences on top of the Office Graph to build rich and interesting applications, whether that be a line of business system, for example, and so forth. Uh, but as Microsoft, we'll release Delve uh, in a few different ways. We're going to do a web application uh, that works on tablets, phones, and PCs. We're also going to release a Windows 8 application and maybe some other mobile apps as well. We call those snacky apps because they're kind of single-purpose apps. Uh, you want to go find a piece of information and get your job done really quickly. But the idea with Delve is it's that an engaging and natural way to go and find information. And many, many, uh, many of the times you go and use Delve, you get prompted with information that's really interesting and that's going on around you. We think that's extremely valuable. So looking into Delve a little bit more, it's really about three main things. It's about staying in the know, finding what you need, and discovering new connections. So in the first bucket, in, in staying, in, uh, sorry, uh, staying in the know, this is really all about finding the information that's the most relevant to you in a very personalized way. So we use things like uh, who your peers are, who works for you, who you uh, communicate with on email, who you talk with on Yammer, those sorts of uh, connections and insights to help drive a richer experience in showing you uh, the information that we think will be the most relevant to you. Finding what you need is basically the end game, right? We want you to be able to get to the information that you need fast and, uh, and in a reliable way. And finally, connecting with experts, or connecting with or discovering new connections in your organization. Finding, say, as, as me, Chris, uh, who I work with on other sides of the organization that I may not be related to in the Active Directory is an extremely interesting type of connection that we want to help expose people to, to help connect with the right experts at the right time uh, about, their, about their content. So to help power this, I mentioned the Office Graph. So this is a new piece of technology uh, that we're releasing uh, in the latter half of this year, so before end of calendar year, into Office 365. It draws from a number of different locations all across the Office 365 service, 
like Exchange, SharePoint, Yammer, and Link. Uh, also the Office apps themselves and the documents and so forth. Uh, and we'll open it up, as I mentioned, to uh, third parties as well, to be able to both pull information from the Office graph uh, and push uh, information into the Office graph. So from all of these different sources, we're able to take advantage of the interactions and the actions and things that are going on in the organization and apply machine learning to understand a little bit more of an insight about what's going on in your organization and use that to drive the experience. Some of the experiences, like I mentioned along the bottom, we'll have some mobile apps, we'll have tablet apps, we'll have web apps, Windows 8 apps and so forth. So you'll be able to consume Delve uh, on a number of different platforms uh, wherever you happen to be, and also bake it into your own systems that you develop too to help drive those rich experiences. So what does the Office Graph do? So today the world kind of looks a little bit like this. You've got individuals, you've got documents, you've got people that you work with, and you've got conversations and all these different kinds of silos in your organization. But there isn't any sort of intrinsic or automa automatic linking between these things at the moment. For example, uh, it would take me going to Yammer and posting a link to a document, potentially, or somebody visiting my MySite and seeing a document in my OneDrive for Business, for example, to see uh, that I might have been interested in that information and working on it. But the system can know these things by the actions that are taken in Office 365. So we're able to watch what goes on uh, in things like uh, relationships between people um, based on information sharing, who you send email to, who you have link conversations with, who you like or what you like in Yammer, for example. Um, and, and so those are the obvious ones. Some of the less obvious ones are things like we're able to derive uh, what presentations you've seen based on information that's in your calendar on who you met with, who you met with and at what time you met with them, and the information that they presented or shared with you from OneDrive for Business, and we can knit those two together to cleverly uh, figure out uh, most likely what PowerPoint presentation was shared during that meeting, for example. Those are some of the more interesting uh, insights that can be gained when you're looking at multiple different sources and the, and the interactions between them. We can also look at things like what information is trending around me what information was shared with me by people, um, who I've been working with through those email conversations and, and link conversations and meetings and so forth. But at the end of the day, the value of the graph grows exponentially with its usage. So over time, these insights will grow larger and larger in volume. We're able to keep a record of who you've worked with and what you're working on and so forth to help drive that uh, value out of the graph. You don't have to do anything specific to have this light up. You'll be able to just work the way you currently work today. Keep interacting with office documents. Keep working on the things in email that you work in, and the graph will just start learning uh, who you talk to and what information you're using to help expose things uh, in a clever way that you haven't been able to before. And like I said, we do that through a bunch of different actions and so forth between all of these relationships of people and content and documents and emails and videos and meetings and all of these kinds of things. When we launch Delve uh, later this year, uh, we'll launch with uh, some content uh, sources on the left-hand side here. So we'll look at people, documents, sites, video, and social uh, interactions, gestures, comments, likes, those sorts of things. And in the future, we'll add the purple ones over on the right-hand side some of the new group technology that's coming in Office 365. Uh, we'll work deeper with meetings and tasks, uh, and we'll also expose the API for you to be able to push information into the Office graph. A good example of this might be from a CRM system or some sort of line of business system, maybe an ordering system, uh, to be able to push signals into the Office graph that we can help use to, uh, to build this information store. You heard me mention signals. Uh, some of the actions uh, or signals that we'll capture are things like modifies and saves, clicks and opens on content, likes and follows and shares and so forth. Uh, and then through to, like I mentioned, third-party APIs to be able to push additional signals into the graph to help drive this experience. 
It's also worth noting that all the while we're going to stay nice and uh, private when we should and public when we should with respect to your privacy. So much like SharePoint Search works today with a very much uh, uh, ACL based system, we'll do the same thing in the Office Graph so that A, we're only exposing information to the folks that should have access to that information. So for example, I can't go and use Delve to go find out you know, the pay scales in different parts of the organization, for example, or so, some sort of other sensitive HR information that I shouldn't necessarily have access to. So we'll always respect that privacy um, the way it should be. But at the end of the day, it is all about aiming to work like a network, to be able to take advantage of the relationships and the things that happen between people and content to drive a better experience for discovery of information. We want to allow third parties to obviously participate in this, but the end goal is to drive insights into this information that already exists in an organization. We just don't take advantage of it very well today. This stuff is already happening. You're already interacting with content. You're already searching for things. You're already meeting with people. We just don't have a way of capturing that and exposing it in a better way. Like I mentioned, we're going to have first party experiences from Microsoft on the Delve apps. We're going to drive deeper connections into Yammer, our group capability coming and into OneDrive. And also we expect you guys to do all the same in your apps. But enough with the slides. Uh, is anybody interested in a demo? Demo? Yay, demo. I was hoping you'd say that. All right. Let me flip out to Delve. Let me get the right monitor here. That's New Zealand in the background, just for the record. Uh-oh, hold on. Huh. Technology malfunction, hold on. That's not a blue screen of death, just for the record. It's gonna go. I got you all excited about a demo. Now I have to deliver. Okay, let's try this. Aha! All right, so Delve, uh, previously codenamed Oslo. What I'll be demoing today is the Windows 8 client application that we've delivered. Uh, and I'll show you, uh, we're, we're not just delivering the Windows 8 application, we're gonna have a, a web-first experience baked into Office 365. And in fact, that's going to be the first experience you see with Delve. We won't come out with the Windows 8 application for a little while longer. Uh, but so what I'll show you is uh, this Windows 8 app that I've got running on my, uh, on my laptop here. And the first thing you'll notice is this content card-based system. Has anybody seen Oslo or Delve to date? A couple of hands? Okay. We talked about it a little bit at SPC, but we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more here. So the first thing you notice is this content-based card system. And so this shows you information about the, uh, the, the things that I might be interested in. This is sort of the home page of Delve. And so what it's done is it's decided this is probably the most relevant stuff to you that you're interested in. So here I can see documents and presentations and so forth from my peers. Uh, for example, from Christoph, who's on the social team. Uh, Bill Bayer, who's a peer of mine, for example. Um, th they've been working on this content. So you can see here it's been modified by Bill or Christoph. Uh, you can see some presentations here and so forth. Further down here, you can see some information coming in from uh, dynamic signals from a, from a peer of mine on the 365 team, uh, Jake. Um, and so this gives you a rich, contextual, and relevant experience right on the homepage of Delve. This is great. So what I do is I come into Delve, and, uh, and we've got this running in production, and I can use it in my, this is not my, uh, uh, my I do more work than just litware sales. Um, so, but we have it running in our production environment uh, for Microsoft, and I can come in here and see what people have been working on. And so that could be from my team, from my peers, or from uh, other folks that I've been interacting with over email and so forth, and it starts learning what's probably the most relevant stuff to me. What I can do is tap on one of these cards to get more information. So if I tap into Northwind and Contoso here, this will launch a presentation, uh, this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation down here. It snaps Delve to the left-hand side and opens the presentation in the, in the web viewer. I can also snap and sort of open and close the, um, the Yammer window here for seeing conversations that are happening about this particular document. So a nice, rich way to converse with folks, 
um, about this document right built, baked into the Office Online uh, web applications. So let's jump back out. Another example I wanted to show is I want to do a quick sneak peek of the new Office 365 video portal that's also coming a little later this year. So let me tap through to uh, Journey in the Cloud. This will open the new video portal that we're releasing uh, in Office 365. Let me jump through to the homepage here and I'll show you what this is all about. Uh, so this is a new experience being uh, uh, delivered into Office 365 uh, shortly. Um, it's delivered through uh, Azure Media Services, so we've got uh, on-the-fly video transcoding and streaming and so forth. Uh, we have um, the ability for enterprise users to publish videos through to various different channels. So for example, here we've got a marketing channel, we've got a community channel, a training channel, and so forth. And I can dive into any of these channels and see relative, uh, relevant content uh, that, uh, to these particular channels. So this is something you'll see coming to all Office 365 enterprise customers in a wee while will help, uh, and will help with uh, really engaging video content in your, in your portals and so forth uh, in Office 365. So let me close that back out. Okay, so that's what you get with the homepage of Delve, so to speak, uh, with what we think is the most relative, uh, relevant and interesting content to you. But we can also dig into this a little more. So if I tap on the, on the uh, search uh, button in the top left-hand side here, Delve gives me some interesting views on content. I can tap into uh, presented to me, for example, and this will give me relevant information about the PowerPoints that Delve thinks, or the Office Graph thinks, have been presented to me. Like I mentioned, we're using, we're, by what we're doing here is we're looking at your calendar and we're meshing what's been shared with you and, and when and so forth to help drive this. Now what's really interesting and cool about this is, I don't know about you, but I go to loads and loads of meetings and people present PowerPoints to me all the time and then I wanna go back to them and take a look at the presentation, but I've got absolutely no idea where it was. Right? Typically, you've got lots and lots of different SharePoint sites. It might be shared on somebody's OneDrive for business. It might be shared off a team site, for example, or something along those lines. And I've got no idea where to go look, and so I have to go find it through search or something like that, or even go back even further and start browsing for it. Uh, and so what this view does is give you a nice sort of cohesive, all-up view of all of the things that have been presented to you. Some of the other views we've got here are shared with me. This is another personal favorite. Again, because things have been shared from all sorts of different locations and all short sorts of different sites, and I want a nice uh, single place to go find uh, all the content that's been uh, shared with me across the organization. Other interesting ones, modified by me, trending around me. So this is based off things like who's commenting, who's liking content in Yammer and so forth, uh, and who's, who's discussing it. Um, and we're able to use social distance uh, metrics and so forth to figure out what is the most sort of trending content around you based on who you work with and what they're talking about uh, and where and so forth. So let's take another look at this. Uh, let me take a look for sales information. So here I've done a, I've done a sort of an ad hoc search for sales and you can see some, rel uh, some relevant content here, um, some different PowerPoints and, and so forth uh, and Word documents. Uh, for the sales results. Um, this is all, this is kind of interesting. You can see we're getting hit highlighting in the actual content itself, um, not just the title of the document and so forth. Also something else to note that I didn't mention is that we pull out, the images that you see are being pulled out of the documents. So it's, we're not just showing the, sort of the, the 10 blue links with very basic sort of icon, icons and things like that beside it. We're actually reaching right into the document and pulling this information out and showing it right here on the, on the, uh, on the content card. Um, that's interesting, I've still got a few results here, uh, and what I, what I wanna do is be able to refine that even a little further. So I know that Bill shared with me a document about sales, and so here I can see the Katoso tablet presentation. I've refined it right down to, uh, to the single document that Bill uh, has been working on. He modified it recently uh, about sales, and so I'm able to drive straight to the content that I want there. If I'm interested in what else Bill has been working on, I can just tap through to Bill. And this gives me an interesting view, not only of the content he's working on down the bottom here, but also the people he's working with. And so over on the right-hand side, you can see his manager, Jake, um, is also manager of Michael, Steve, and uh, Jim, uh, who are on the 365 team. 
and you can see some of his team there, Anne, David, and, and Garrett. Now that's stuff that's pulled from Active Directory, and that's, that's interesting and all. I, I love surfing our, uh, we're in it like a 120 something thousand person company now, and, um, and I love surfing the gal and finding out who works for who and finding out what they do and things. So this is really interesting for that. However, if you surf the gal or sur surf the global address list uh, and look at you know, who reports to who, it's not, it's not very good at telling you about who actually works with who, right? It's just the hierarchy of people in the organization. But what we also do in Delve is work out who you're working with, who you're actually working with. So for example, Rob Young here uh, and Christoph and Darina uh, work, with, uh, work with Bill, and we're able to figure that out from the email conversations, from link conversations, and who you're actually going to meetings with and so forth to be able to figure some of this stuff out. And then also who we've got in common. So um, both Bill and I uh, work with this chap here. And so that's really interesting. This is a much nicer way to figure out you know, who does Bill actually interact with in the organization. So we can, we can uh, delve a little deeper, excuse the pun, and, uh, and go find out what information Bill has been working on here, uh, what, he's been, what he's been presented, what he's been, uh, what he's been modifying and so forth, and find information about Bill. But that's a really nice view uh, on, on what Bill's been up to. So that's Delve. Let me switch back. Uh, okay. No, I don't really want to start right from the beginning of the slide deck. Let me, let me pick back up. Uh -uh. All right. So here's a screenshot of the web experience of Delve. It's going to be baked into Office 365. You can see up on the top right-hand side there, you know, beside Outlook, Calendar, People, Yammer Sites, OneDrive, you've also got Delve. That'll start showing up when we start rolling it out. We're testing with a few customers at the moment, uh, but we're getting real close to, to being done with that. So the web experience is very similar to the Windows 8 experience. Like I mentioned, it's going to be the first thing that ships with Delve. So you're going to get the web experience just magically show up in 365 enterprise SKUs um, uh, when we release it. There's some other interesting things that Delve does in the web that we're, uh, that we're going to release, like a little people list down the, right hand, uh, down the left hand side here uh, about who, who the people that you work with regularly are and who's going to be the most interesting to you. Uh, and so you'll see us uh, rapidly innovate on the web experience uh, once we release it and adding new capabilities as we go forth. One thing I do want to touch on is extensibility. So like I mentioned, we want you to be able to take uh, the Office graph and build additional um, capabilities or experiences for users. This could be baking it into the, to the apps that you build, whether it be a line of business app or a phone app or whatever it happens to be. And we're going to produce a set of APIs. They're coming in two waves. The first wave is going to be um, reading the graph. So you'll be able to query the graph using graph, graph oh my goodness, that's a tongue twister, graph query language. Uh, you'll be able to query it, get, sig get the information about the various activities in the graph and so forth, and then show them in your own apps. And then uh, a little later, we're going to release a second API, which is uh, all about pushing information into the graph. So like I mentioned, maybe a CRM system, maybe a support ticketing system. Maybe you want to say, hey, a new support ticket's been, uh, been worked on by, uh, by Mark or, or something along those lines, and use that to help build the knowledge going on in the graph to help drive these experiences. And really, the world is your oyster on this stuff. We're, ex we're looking forward to seeing what people uh, build with these APIs uh, as we go forward. So Delve is all about getting work done. Uh, long gone are the days of having to go browse for information. We think we've moved past the 10 blue links, and we feel like we've got a much better experience for discovering uh, content and information based on the things and the interactions in an organization and so forth. If you want to learn more, I uh, suggest you go check out at Office Delve on, uh, on Twitter. The team is. Um, the team is, uh, is tweeting about Delve, uh, and, we'll, and you'll be able to go learn more about uh, when it's coming out and, and information about it and so forth. So definitely go check at Office Delve 
uh, when, you get, when you get done here today. So that is Delve. Uh, the next thing I want to briefly talk about in about the next nine minutes or so is what we call Apps for Office 365. Now the reason I want to talk about this is partially because of what we expect you to go build on top of the Office graph, but it's also because uh, I realize that we've got some devs in the room, no doubt. Hands up, devs. I, I like to say, <laughs> if, uh, yeah, okay, cool. We've got like probably maybe about a third, maybe 25%, something along those lines. We've got some devs in the room. Now, the world of office development is changing, and primarily we're doing that uh, for a few reasons to do with the cloud, and we'll get into that in a second. But I wanted to basically update everybody on what we're doing with what we call Apps for Office 365. Uh, and as you heard about customization and so forth, uh, you know, in, the, in, in SharePoint past, uh, there are some pretty hairy situations you can get yourself into with customizations or development on, on the SharePoint platform. And one of the things we're doing with uh, Apps for Office is really trying to make that a much better experience for building on top of our products. Just as a little FYI here, Sachin Adela is my friend at the moment. Every speech he does up on stage at WPC um, and so forth, he's talking about 365 the whole time. He says it's the most strategic developer surface area for, oh, sorry, the most strategic developer surface area for us is Office 365. And the reason he says that, it's not just because he's bullish about it and wants to promote it, uh, but it's because it has all of this rich business data. It's where people are doing real work, and he's super bullish about that stuff. Uh, so this is extremely exciting for us having the, having the kind of the leader of our, of our company talking about uh, our products. No pressure, of course. But if we think about where we've come from, office development has changed. Uh, and if, uh, if there's those of you in the room who, have, who are familiar with VBA and so forth, we introduced that decades ago. And it is still the predominant way of working with uh, or programming against Office content. There are gajillions, that's a technical term, gajillions and gajillions of businesses that run on macros in Excel. It is frightening how many businesses bet, their, you know, bet the farm, so to speak, on some hokey old VBA in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and so we introduced that back in the 90s. And then in the 2000s, we got a little bit more sophisticated. We let you stick managed code inside the documents as well. Who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> what can possibly go wrong, right? So then we started letting you add com add-ins. Who, hands up, who's seen the white screen of Doom and Outlook? Like, you know that, like, I'm working on it? No, that's SharePoint. Hold on. That's the, the, the not responding is what I really meant. That Outlook thing. So whether you, whether you, whether you realize it or not, Chances are you've got add-ins in Outlook, COM-based add-ins that run in process with your Office client applications, and they're nasty little buggers. <laughs> they will get in there and crash your apps in no time. And lots of them are third-party apps that go and install them without you even realizing. So I suggest you all go fire up Outlook and go into the options section and go check out the COM add-ins you've got. You've probably got all sorts of things goofing up your Office apps. And, uh, and slowing things down. But this was all based on technology uh, called COM, and we let you stick .NET code in there through Visual Studio tools for Office and so forth. And in SharePoint land, I'm sure nobody has ever written any bad SharePoint code, <laughs> but, but you know, we let you stick what we call full trust code that ran in process in SharePoint. And you know, <clears throat> as a Microsoft person, I get to sit on these conference bridges when really big problems happen in, in customers' farms. And like 98% of the time, it's due to third-party custom code that's been written. The root cause analysis, either memory leaks, or they're doing some sort of tight looping and bringing the farm down or doing all that. We let you get into the bowels of SharePoint, right? And do all sorts of nasty stuff in there. But moving forward, we need to get a little bit smarter about the way we let people extend our applications and, ex and build on our platform. And we need to do that for a couple of reasons. One, it's because of all these devices that people have. And two, it's because of the cloud. These are really interesting points. You know, previously, we didn't have to worry about all these BYOD scenarios of people trying to get access to apps on phones and tablets and all that sort of stuff. But now we have to think about these things. And so, for example, those COM add-ins you've stuffed into Excel and Word and Outlook and stuff, they won't run on your phone. 
And so we think there's a better way to go and build and extend Office and SharePoint to be able to do those sorts of things. We talk about our investments in this area in three main areas. We say, we want you to go build contextual apps. What do we mean by contextual apps? I like to use the analogy of somebody coming into my house and hanging a painting on my wall. Right? It's like, I want to invite you in to hang a little bit of your application inside my house so I get to go view it. And in the office world, that's you coming in to say Outlook and sticking something on the Outlook wall. For example, it might be you know, an app that communicates with one of your line of business systems or a CRM app inside of Outlook or something like that. That's contextual apps. Then there's a second category of apps uh, that build on a set of robust APIs. So this is kind of like when you build a house, plumbing it with our services. So uh, for example, you might have sewer connections, you might have water, power, internet, you know, just the important ones. Uh, and so we expect people to be able to go build things like mobile applications that are plumbed with the services from Office 365 to get access to documents, search, information about people and so forth, people's calendars, so being able to push information easily into people's calendars through a rich set of uh, robust APIs that we provide for you in Office 365. And we expect you to do all of that using a whole bunch of flexible tools. Of course, I put the Microsoft ones on the slide here. But we have a set of partners building apps for Office and apps for SharePoint and so forth using tools like Ruby on Rails and PHP and Node.js, all these sort of non-traditional Microsoft development uh, technologies or things that you typically haven't used in the past uh, with, uh, with building apps for Office. And we're totally cool with that. That's completely comfortable. There's an app in Office called Poll Everywhere, uh, which I demoed at WPC. It's about real-time uh, audience polling and interaction. I'll, I'll try and show it in my session tomorrow. It's, a full, it's fully uh, running on the LAMP stack but, and, and running on uh, Ruby on Rails, uh, and it's baked into PowerPoint as a way to do like text message polling and real-time audience interaction in PowerPoint. Very, very cool stuff. And we're completely cool with you using whatever tools you want. I mentioned there's two types of apps. The first type of apps that you can stick inside Office, and then there's the second type of apps, uh, second type, or sort of second category of apps, which use Office 365 services to power their experiences. So whichever camp you happen to be in, also something worth of note here, it's, these are not apps like that you necessarily have to stick in a store and sell, right? I think that's a common misconception, is that we're expecting you to build some sort of mobile app or some sort of app for Office, and then put it in the Office store to go and sell. Uh, we expect um, uh, systems integrators and services organizations and customers and developers inside uh, commercial businesses to go build apps just for them and deliver, uh, deliver and extend, uh, sorry, extend Office um, and build on top of our platform using this exact same model. It's not just about ISVs putting apps in a store. Now the key thing with all of this is that you get a mobile-friendly experience. So here I've got, a, I've got a screenshot of the LinkedIn application. It's an Outlook app. Uh, you can go and download it from the, from the Office store uh, if you're running Office 2013. And the way the, out, the, way the Outlook apps work, uh, so it, it's contextual in that when you're viewing an email, you get a series of apps pop up depending on which ones you've got installed. And in this case, I can go see all my LinkedIn contacts that have sent that email, uh, or sorry, if they're not my content, con, uh, contact on LinkedIn, I can go and make them a contact on LinkedIn or friend them on LinkedIn or whatever the right buzzword is uh, for, that, for that connection. So that works on the desktop Outlook application, and it also works in OA on the web as well. And that's that key difference between trying to do this stuff with add-ins, uh, with managed code and com and so forth, and being able to do this through the app model. Then when you move to a tablet, so a good example of this is OA for the iPad, for example. Uh, or OA for Android as well. You can go download that from the, from the Google Play Store or, or, the, or the iTunes Store, or whatever they call it. And, and you can go put that on your iPad and you'll get the exact same app. Again, you can't do that with managed code and com and so forth. And then the same thing goes for the phone. So our goal, our goal for all of this is to make these apps and extensions and all the sort of stuff that you guys go build available in whatever endpoint, we call them endpoints, whatever endpoint Office happens to land on, and there are billions of them. There are billions of phones in the world. Our goal is to go stick Office on every one of them. There are billions of users of Office with Office client applications. Our goal is to go get every one of them too, and have apps that uh, are able to surface and enrich the experience. 
I mentioned being able to power your own applications uh, with, with services from Office 365. You can get access to things like documents and mail and calendar, people search and social information um, through a rich set of uh, robust REST-based APIs up in Office 365. They're REST-based, if you know how to deal with HTTP and XML and JSON and that sort of stuff. For any developers in the room, it's all you know, uh, sort of super standards-friendly stuff. You can go call Office 365. We do things like OAuth to be able to deal with authentication to the cloud. Uh, and we hook up with Azure AD for getting access to things uh, and only letting apps get access to what they should do. We're shipping SDKs on all the platforms. So today we have a, um, a SDK for Android. We, we put all our open source code up on github.com forward slash office dev. Uh, so you can go check that out. We have the Android SDK up there today. We're working on the iOS SDK and we're working on additional tooling for the Windows uh, scenarios through Visual Studio, with our friends in the Visual Studio team. But at the end of the day, they're all, they're all sort of designed for this openness and flexibility. We want you to be able to call these things from any platform or any device. And we want you to be able to do it in a nice, consistent way so that it's powering a world of devices, whatever your, happen whatever your choice of device happens to be. A quick example of this is Zapier. Anybody familiar with Zapier? Super cool. If you haven't tried Zapier, go check out zapier.com. It's basically a tool that lets you connect clouds or connect services. So for example, uh, they baked in Office 3, 365 integration into Zapier so that when I go create a task in Asana, I can go push that as an event into Office 365 automatically without any additional effort. So you'll see them connecting all sorts of different services and so forth. Trello, another favorite of mine, being able to uh, pull those things together. I want to show you a quick uh, video before I end, just to, you know, you can hear me spraffing up here all day, but really we have real partners, real customers doing this stuff in the cloud today. And so I'm going to roll this video. It's about Nintex and DocuSign and the work they're doing in the cloud together. Most business processes require approvals, and the majority of those require some type of signature to be captured. It was only logical for the leading workflow vendor and the leading digital signature company to work together for the benefit of the customers. Nintex is focused on workflow with deep integrations with SharePoint, and DocuSign is focused on digital transaction management. Nintex customers can add a DocuSign step to their business process, adding the ability to collect signatures securely and electronically through DocuSign. And once a DocuSign transaction is complete, the Nintex process just continues through to completion. Microsoft has been highly supportive of our efforts from the very beginning. And now, with this partnership, we're seeing even more support. That support comes to us because we're opening up a new way of partnering in the cloud that just didn't exist before. The cloud has been proven for IT to be the most optimal way to do what they do for their businesses, and Office 365 to us is the gateway to those benefits. We chose to build on the Office 365 platform for two reasons. Everybody is there, and that is where they're doing their daily productive work, and the opportunity to integrate based on the app model and the tools available was so rich. If you can take the work that people are doing in Word, Excel, PowerPoint, tie that together with a process platform that helps drive things like approvals, feedback, managing expense claims and the likes, then you get a really fantastic alignment in terms of what organizations are trying to achieve. Our customers are using the Office 365 apps in a number of ways that makes their day more productive. Our objective when building these applications was to put DocuSign in Office 365 where they're working, while they're working, in the most convenient possible way. The real winners are our customers who can now differentiate their services to win more business and reduce costs. With the combination of Microsoft, DocuSign, and Nintex, customers can increase the speed, reliability, and importantly, the efficiency of their most critical business processes. The most exciting part about Nintex is its rapid growth. DocuSign has experienced the same kind of growth that we are. To put two fast-moving trains together is very exciting. Being able to team with Nintex to automate business process and deliver end-to-end -end digital transactions is a global game changer.
So just in finishing, I have another session tomorrow that you can come along to all about building apps for Office, building apps for SharePoint. Uh, I won't go through this, but I'll talk about the continuous innovation cycle. Uh, we're constantly releasing new capabilities and so forth. And so we'll get a, uh, get a chance in that session tomorrow to go take a look at some of the things we've done this year and last year and some of the stuff that we're currently working on that'll be coming later this year uh, and, and onwards. Go check out dev.office.com if you want more information. Uh, it's where we publish all the stuff about building on Office. Uh, and with that, I would like to wrap up and say thanks very much for uh, listening to me, listening to Dell or talking about Delve uh, and building apps for Office. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so we saw a couple of really interesting experiences on, uh, on, with Delve and so forth. Now I'd like to introduce Dean Edwards, who's the Windows and Surface Business Group Manager for Microsoft here in New Zealand, who's going to talk about a rich set of devices that you can go build apps for uh, in, this, uh, in, in your organizations. Cheers. Side of Amsterdam, just by my left brain, just by the side of the tin man. Okay, good morning everyone. So um, listen, thank you Chris. And um, look, in my job I get to play around with cool devices like this one here. So we've heard a lot this morning around um, some of the big trends like mobility, like the cloud, uh, like productivity, flexible work style, etc. Now the reality is that a lot of these trends come together and they're experienced on the end user computing device. Um, and of course, this is a space that Microsoft has been pretty active in. Uh, we elected to get into the first party PC hardware business through our Surface family of devices about two years ago now. And when we did look at developing Surface, this is the, this is the particular problem statement that we set out to try to address. We hear a lot from customers that, you know, they want a tablet. They want a tablet because it's it's thin and it's light. Um, you know, it's great for consuming content. It's got a certain cool factor associated with it. But on the other side, they need a PC. They need a PC to get work done. Uh, they need a PC uh, for the full desktop experience. And from the IT side of things, um, they need a device that can, can be controlled and can be managed. So this, of course, is where Surface um, plays in this space. So right now, this is our Surface family. We have the, uh, the Surface 2, which is a thin and light tablet uh, that runs Office, 10 inch, 10 inch device. And we have the Surface Pro 2, also a 10 inch tablet, but it runs Windows 8 Pro and it has the full power of a PC. But coming very soon, we are launching Surface Pro 3. Surface Pro 3 is a tablet that can replace your laptop. Uh, it's the most powerful, thinnest and lightest Surface Pro yet. It's a full PC uh, and it's a brilliant tablet. pretty good, huh? 
Okay, so I positioned Surface as a laptop replacement, um, but not just any laptop, it's, it, it's, a, it's a premium laptop. And I, I don't say that lightly. Um, most, most experts agree that there are probably four things that you need um, in order to have a really great premium laptop. You need great performance, you need a long battery life, you need a wonderful screen, and it needs to be a thin and light device. So with Surface Pro 3, we've, um, we've deliberately avoided any hint of compromise to make sure that we can deliver on all of those aspects. So it's thinner and it's lighter than any other premium laptop on the market. Uh, the battery life provides nine hours of, um, of web browsing or, or eight hours of local video playback. It's got a really gorgeous full HD screen. Uh, and in terms of performance, it runs the fourth generation Intel Core i chipset. So it's very, very fast. Uh, it also runs Windows 8.1 Pro, so it will cope with your Windows Store apps and any of the, of the desktop software that runs today on Windows 7. And of course for businesses it means that you can apply the same security and management tools that you use today to manage all of your other Windows PCs. Okay, so um, you know the Surface Pro 3 is really um, a beautifully engineered de device. Uh, when you pick it up and you look at it, you'll really appreciate the build quality. Um, it's also tough. So it's made out of a very durable magnesium casing and it has impact resist resistant Gorilla Glass. I mentioned the screen. So it's a, it's a 12 inch display, 2160 by 1440, uh, full HD and it's in a three by two aspect ratio, which gives you even more screen real estate. So all up, the screen is about 40% larger than the Surface Pro 2 screen. And in terms of being thin and light, the Surface Pro 3 is just 9.1 millimeters thick, uh, and it weighs 798 grams. So by comparison, it's, it's quite a bit thinner and lighter than a MacBook Air. Now, you know, the, one of the things that really differentiates Surface is, um, is the multi-position kickstand. So, you know, we've done a lot of work to really improve the kickstand um, and to enable any position that, that, at all. So, um, you know, one of the things that's really quite interesting if you're into design is the friction hinge, which, is, which enables the multi-position kickstand. It's really a, a minor uh, engineering marvel in its own right. So of course this gives you the ability to use it right out to 150 degrees, or you can basically set it at, at any angle that you like, just as, as you would with a laptop. Um, now the type cover has been an area that we've also improved significantly. So this is the type cover here for Surface Pro 3. It's still incredibly thin and incredibly light, but it's also a full keyboard with movable keys. And we've done a lot of work with the trackpad. The trackpad's 40% larger than the previous Surface Pro. Uh, it has a ceramic coating, so it's, it's just a very, very nice experience to use the trackpad now. And then we've also, you know, a, a lot of people still use a pen and paper for, you know, hours during their business day. So we've done a lot of work to improve the writing experience with Surface Pro 3. And a part of this is to do with the three by two aspect ratio for the device, which is uh, very similar to an A4 sheet of paper. But we've also really worked on the pen experience. This is the Surface Pen. It's very, you know, it's got a, it's built of aluminium casing. It's very comfortable in your hand. Um, the, inking, the inking appears very, very close to the pen tip. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a really, really nice writing experience as well. Surface Pro 3 also comes with a docking station. So this will be available just two weeks after the Surface Pro 3 launches. It'll give you all the ports, all the expandability that you need with this device. So the Surface Pro 3 is going to be available on the 28th of August. Um, it'll come in a whole range of different configurations, all the way up to an i7 with 8 gig of RAM and a 512 hard drive. Um, it's available for pre-order right now, 
and um, I would invite you to come and check it out on the Microsoft stand in the exhibition space um, and uh, just, just have a look at the device for yourself. So with that, uh, I'm getting the, the sign to move on, so I'm going to hand over to Debbie who's going to close out the keynote. Apologies for running a little over here on time, but I will be snappy with a lot of information for you, hopefully. Um, so just to close out, there was lots of key points that I think were raised in the keynote, and um, I wanted to parallel some of them back to the sessions and to the things that we have happening here at the event for the next couple of days to make them kind of applicable for you. So from the cloud perspective, we do have a few sessions on, Elaine Van Bergen has one, for example, on what cloud fits your requirements. If you want to know anything at all about any of the topics that we we'll discuss, come and see me or one of the speakers or one of the organisers to help work through the agenda there. As far as business transformation, we also have some extremely good business speakers here, and Michael Sampson's one of them, who's doing a session next on reimagining effective work. So sessions like that are of, of most value. Um, Julia talked a lot about mobility, but one of the other things I really liked was the fact that she paralleled some extremely cool examples back to things that are happening today. And one of the things we do have at these events is amazing case studies. We've got 11, I think it is, so 11 different customers sharing their, sharing their stories at different sessions. And I'm about to show you um, the OneNote app, and there's a whole page of which those case studies are and which customers are actually speaking. The other key topic that Vaughan talked about was knowledge management. And we've actually got, and I'm about to talk about a few cool initiatives that we've introduced with this event. Paul Combs is probably our expert on this, and he's got a couple of sessions here at this event. But also, he's brought a new initiative to this event called the Glimmer Conference Explorer. And you'll see at the booth at the Connect Zone out here, and another one inside the exhibit area, a way that what's happening is there's a few sessions throughout the event that are being videoed, and they're being glimmified, as they're called. Um, which means that Paul and his team are actually mapping some of these sessions, and it's a way of capturing informal knowledge and then being able to surface it through an application. So go up to the booths, they're all touch screen, have a play with it. If you get stuck, go to the Glimmer booth, but it's called the Conference Explorer, and it's just something we've introduced to the conference. We've also got John White out from Canada, along with other international speakers, but who's doing a couple of very cool business intelligence sessions, and I know that came up in a couple of the topics. I'll just get you to switch back to the other screen if that's okay, and I'm just going to bring up. So the other two initiatives we've started for this um, conference. Mark, can you... S <laughs> um, one is we started a Yammer group, and I'm hoping most of you have joined that. It's been really active um, when we did the Australian conference next week. Oh, by the way, the Glimmer sessions that were all videoed at the Australian conference will also be available for you guys to see when, it, when it's taken public. So we started the AMA group, which has given everyone the opportunity to connect leading up to the event, but also a chance for you to connect with the speakers, both here today and tomorrow, and then onwards. So we will keep that Yammer group active. And the other thing we've done, and uh, now I'm going to fail on <laughs> using the sessions. Thank you. As we have a OneNote application for keeping everything about the conference. So this is like our conference guide. We actually did steal this from the SharePoint conference in Vegas, but it's been a great way of being able to share information right up to the minute because we've had multiple people editing, editing it, obviously. So you can, and th there should be links everywhere for this, and in the registration email, they'll have a link to it. So there's two versions. There's the online version, which is what you're seeing here. And you can see that it's got all the different information about what's open, what the wireless code is. There's a mobile application as well. So that has all the full agenda on it, and there's a link to it in there. But there's also a downloadable application, uh, sorry, a downloadable package file of this OneNote application. Now, the reason that's kind of cool is because you can download it to whatever device you're using. You can then store it within your own OneDrive or SharePoint or your OneDrive for business. And then you can, st uh, you can take your own session notes. So there's a session notepad, and then it allows you to then add your own notes throughout the session go back to your organisation and hopefully share some of what you've learned. The other thing that's on here is we have links to the conference map. So I just wanted to touch on that briefly. This room, when you, when you go out of here, 
uh, will have morning tea, and this room will be divided into three. So on the agenda, you'll see great room one, two, and three, which are these rooms here. And then the fourth room is actually the West Haven room, which is through the doors at the end there. Next door here, where all the noise is, is where the exhibition area is. And right out the doors here is the connect zone. The connect zone's like an area for, if you want to meet with the speakers after you've seen a session, they'll head back there after their session so you can continue the conversation. And the other thing I wanted to point out, if I just look at the agenda, whoops, better touch the right screen, <laughs> is we have a, the demo zone. So within the exhibition area, we decided this year to try something, again, a little bit different and have a whole series of very short product demonstrations. So if there's something in particular you want to see, you can just go and take a seat and watch that product demonstration. It's in the corner of the exhibition area there. And the other thing I wanted to call out was the Vegas night, which is tonight. We had a lot of fun with this in Australia last week, and so hopefully it'll be just as fun this week. Uh, there'll be all sorts of tables. Feel free to dress up. There is a um, money wheel, which there'll be a whole lot of prizes given away from our sponsors. And it's just a chance to relax and connect with everyone that's here. And that was the page of the case studies that I was talking about. And I think I've covered just, oh, there's a note, there's, there is a section here on using this notebook, and there is a section there on the whole Glimmer Conference Explorer. There's one page that I've just added, and I don't think we've synchronized on here, um, which is Microsoft just actually announced this morning what they're doing with their international events. So they have the SharePoint Conference, which was in Vegas this year, and they've decided from next year to make it a, and I'm trying to remember what it was called now, a unified technology event, which means that they're broadening, and we are doing exactly the same thing for next year, so I just wanted to mention that. What it means is that instead of it just being the SharePoint conference, it's also going to include the Exchange conference, Link, um, I believe they're including TechEd America. We are, are going to expand, I guess, our conference to, instead of being the New Zealand SharePoint conference, more to being Share Their Point conference, which means that we will include a lot more of those Office, OneNote, Blink, Yammer, all of those other products. So we're hoping that that'll provide more value and more breadth to the content that we do have. So ask us about that for sure. I think I've covered everything, and I really hope you have a wonderful two days. Enjoy it and make the most of your time here. Thank you.